everyone. My name is Ann Savage, and I work at the ed in the Education Department at the Library of Congress. We are thrilled to welcome you to the second annual online conference for educators. Our session today, Library of Congress 101 for Teachers, and now I would like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker for this evening is Cheryl Letterly. She has worked as an educational resources specialist at the Library of Congress since December of 2003. In that role, she has advanced the library's educational mission by providing professional development both in person and via webinar. She's also played a significant role in shaping the library's online repository of classroom materials and resources for teachers at loc.gov slash teachers, and she continues to contribute to the development of those materials. Cheryl has 15 years experience teaching English at both the high school and community college levels. Welcome, Cheryl. Thanks, Anne, and welcome to all of you who I expect have taught a full day, and I appreciate that you are choosing to spend your evening with us. Um, I want to explore what the Library of Congress has for teachers, looking particularly at lesson plans and primary source sets, webinars, and professional development opportunities. And then I want to spend just a little bit of time introducing you to what's behind all of these teacher materials, and we'll explore very briefly ways to tap into those vast library collections to find even more. What I've put up on screen now is uh, Capitol Hill, and you can see the Capitol there in the foreground. And behind it, and just to the right on the screen, there's a domed building. That's the very beautiful Thomas Jefferson Building, um, completed in 1897. Um, there are two other buildings on Capitol Hill, in addition to the Jefferson Building, um, that comprise the library on Capitol Hill. We also have some off-site storage. That gives you a little bit of context for where I'm coming from. I've also put some statistics on the screen just because I like the numbers. Um, the library has more than 160 million items. There are more than 830 miles of bookshelves. The library receives through copyright deposit and other means approximately 15,000 items a day, and of those, it adds to the collections about 12,000 items a day. Um, that's a big number for any of you, but I, I saw several of you were librarians. Just think for a minute about the task of processing up to 12 million, excuse me, 12,000 items a day. We'd love to have you visit us on Capitol Hill, but until that time, you can visit us from wherever you have a sturdy internet connection using this access point, the library's website, loc.gov. Feel free to explore these links or sit back and relax and make notes for yourself about what you want to come back to. Again, this is the home page, access to all of the collections. My home and Anne's at the library are the especially for teachers section and I'm going to spend the first part of our time together. Um, my professional life is dedicated to making it easier for you to find and use those online collections and several of you are saying uh, you have various levels of experience. Um, I'm glad that some of you have are feeling comfortable with it. Even if you are a very comfortable user, I'm going to guess that time is always in short supply for a busy teacher. That was my experience teaching. So I'm going to hit some highlights of, of shortcuts that you might take. And the first one highlighted in the pink box just under the classroom materials black bar um, is the Teaching with the Library of Congress blog. We've been blogging for several years now. In addition to what we publish a couple of times a week, it's also keyword searchable so that you can go back and explore the archive. And I have search results uh, using the term informational text. As a former English teacher, I get pretty excited about informational text. And so um, I like that as my search result. But you can search by other things. Um, topics, um, grade levels, and so forth. 
So I would commend this to you. If you'd like to hear from us on a regular basis, subscribe to the blog. You can see at the top to the right, there's a, an orange subscribe link, and that would have this sent to your inbox when we publish it. Back to the teacher's homepage to orient you. I'm going to visit next classroom materials and I'm not going to spend too much time clicking around any of these pages. What I'm hoping to do is alert you to the possibility that they exist and um, invite you to come back and explore on your own. So the classroom materials page, at the pink box now is around one of my favorite features and that is it's searchable by standards. Um, if you can squint a little, you can see that the radio buttons allow you to uh, search by common core or state content or a selection of national organizations. Um, and clicking into common core or state content gives you the option to then identify your state since um, different states apply those standards differently. The first stop on our tour of classroom materials is primary source sets. And that's just what they sound like. They're sets of primary sources. Um, and we started developing those when in conversation with teachers about using the lesson plans that we've been publishing for quite a number of years, we realized that teachers are taking apart the lesson plans, looking for primary sources of use, and then for teaching ideas. And this sounded very familiar from my days as a teacher. I didn't teach somebody else's lesson plan, but I loved to mine their ideas. And so we put the primary source sets together. It's 18 primary sources on a particular theme or topic, and there are more than 30 of these now. And then each one we wrap in a teacher's guide. Looks about like this. This is the top of it. Um, with a brief historical background about the theme or topic. And then in addition, also teaching ideas for it. Each primary source set also links to the teacher's guides and analysis tool. And several of the presentations during the online conference have made reference to this. The um, analysis tool looks pretty simple because the design of it is pretty simple. It is three columns, observe, reflect, and question. And then an invitation for students to think about what they'd like to investigate to learn more about. Um, <clears throat> the process itself is way less simple. And that's reflected in the upper right corner of this, the circular arrow that says observe, reflect, and question. And we recognize that it is not at all a linear process, but uh, flat paper sort of limits our ability to represent that. So. We've done what we can. You'll notice if you look that it's available by di for different formats. And I've pulled that up. Choosing a format changes the question set. You can see there's a red uh, circle around select the format of your primary source, and then another red circle around a question. Clicking on that question will bring up a question. Uh, clicking on that question icon will bring up a question. And you can customize that by, by format or just ask questions that are generally useful for helping students dig deeper into looking at and thinking about primary sources. Here's a sample. This is a set from the more general ones. There are 10 format-specific teacher's guides in addition to this. <clears throat> at the bottom of the teacher's guide, you can see that there are some follow-up activity ideas, um, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. And I think of those um, levels as not only the complexity for the student, but the complexity for the teacher um, to implement them. And generally speaking, the beginning ones are a very easy lift on the teacher and still give rich information. I use a lot of beginning ones when I do professional development programs. So there certainly can still lead to some rich and deep thinking and information. A selection of the primary source sets are also available as free ebooks through the iTunes store. Those have the same content from the primary source sets, but the technology allows us to embed some, some tools. 
Um, so if you have iPads available in your school, you might check these out. If you don't, you can still get all the same content through those primary source sets. I return to the classroom materials page. I'm not going to take time to tour the lesson plans because I, your teachers and you all know what a lesson plan looks like. Um, I would invite you to explore those. It's a great way to find some ideas and a, a shortcut for finding primary sources as well if you find a lesson plan on something you teach. I do want to take a look at a couple of the presentations. Um, we have a fair selection of them. And it struck me as timely to feature for you today Elections the American Way. Um, these uh, feature primary sources from the library's collection, collections, I should say, but also um, give a little more context and history. So if, you're, if you or your students want to do a little bit of reading on the process or issues from past presidential elections or the right to vote, um, this would be, for example, a resource for that. Back to the teacher's homepage, I'd like to look at professional development. Right now, you're all participating in, in an example of professional development that we offer for distance learning. And there is a link on the professional development subpage. It's toward the bottom of the screen, um, boxed in pink for webinars. We have quite a number of these that we've been doing. And you may be wondering, why is Cheryl telling me this about past events? Well, you can see, um, looking at this grid, that we record most of them and make them available after the fact, uh, just as we'll be recording and making available the 15 hours of content from, from this online conference. We have past events. We also do on-site workshops, including a week-long summer teacher institute here at the library. If you're interested in that, the best way the best way to find out about that is to subscribe to the blog and watch for it. We usually publicize the application mm, sometime around December-ish, um, December, early January. Um, and the, the first notice of that will go out through the blog and our other social media channels. Back to the home page for the Library of Congress. I want to talk just a little bit about how to find your way around that. Um, many of you said you have some comfort with searching on the library, so I'm going to guess that if that's true, you've met this homepage search bar. And this searches most of the library's online collections. <clears throat> there are two sections that are not included, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit, but this searches um, more than 30 million files. You can narrow your search by format if you know, for example, that you want a map to fill in something in your lesson plan, or you're working with learners who respond particularly well to visual materials, maps, or photos, prints, or drawings. You can, you can search by format. Um, once you get a search result, you can also search by, narrow your search by other facets um, that'll look very familiar. If you're, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you'll, you'll recognize it. You can narrow it by date range, for example, in addition to format once you get to that results page. And so I'd encourage you to explore that and find your way around. I will note that um, a relatively recent, as in the last five, six years, is that any of those search results that you narrow can be shared as links. So if you need to, if you need to support your students by identifying uh, a body of possibilities for them that they then dig around in, <clears throat> you can share those search results. I want to dig now into two sections that are not covered in that home page search. The first is Historic American Newspapers, Chronicling America. How many of you have used Chronicling America? And if you've used it and want to talk a little bit about what your experience has been, um, I think it's very valuable for people to hear from those of you who are in the field practicing. Um, I know theoretically what it looks like with students, but my audience now is adults. I'm going to continue showing you how to get to this. You can click through from the library site or directly from that link that Ann put in. Um, it's also a good search term, Chronicling America. 
Chronicling America is a website that provides free public access to more than 11 million pages of, of historic U.S. newspapers. I'm going to hit some highlights, but if you want to go deeper into this, several of the folks here today have mentioned that they watched the earlier session, and that'll be available in the recording. Vicki, yes, it can be difficult to read and hone in on what they want or need. Also very exciting. Um, the earlier session did give a little bit of conversation about that, and we also, last year's online conference, Last year's online conference had a whole session, and our last year's teacher in residence had a passion for working with newspapers and joined that conversation. Um, so you might look at that if you're looking for even more tips. The easiest way to get into Chronicling America is to do a keyword search. It can, however, yield a daunting number of possibilities. Um, this is the results from the word prohibition. You'll notice if you haven't used this, you might be a little surprised to see all the pink boxes. You can see in some of the headlines, those pink boxes are around the search term, in this case, prohibition. Um, Janelle, it is, let me go back a couple of slides and, and bring Janelle up. I will also say that um, it being a website, expect that it will change. So um, I'm certainly happy to show you the path from the home page. You're probably better off if you remember the name of it so that you can search for it and find it. But from the home page, uh, click into Historic Newspapers. And then from Historic Newspapers, we have several different collections. Click into Chronicling America. And we're back to the search term. If your students or you are looking for a real great shortcut, I'm going to guess that some of you don't know this. Um, go to the Recommended Topics page. These are um, guides to topics, more than 250 of them, put together by experts from the newspaper divi division that provides background information for well-known and lesser-known events with important dates search strategies and sample articles and I'm going to go I'm going to play with the drawing arrow and point out to you where I found this so from Chronicling America homepage it's right there in the left nav and it's called recommended topics this map shows the scope of Chronicling America um, it's actively adding new states every year and um, recently added several new partners. You can see that it now covers most of the United States. The states in gray have not yet applied or received a grant from the NEH, but they are actively working on that. I'm going to pause. Any questions about the about Chronicling America, anything that you want me to go back to before I move forward. As I say, I'm, I'm hitting the highlights fairly quickly, um, knowing that we have a whole session on Chronicling America and that you can view the recording at your leisure and explore at your leisure. Is it common not to find what you're looking for? Man, that's a, that's a tough question, Janelle. It's not uncommon because, for one thing, you're searching in historical collections. And they might not use the language that you're uh, accustomed to, which is one of the reasons that those suggested search strategies in the topics are a real gold mine. Um, it is keyword searchable. Uh, which is a huge boon, but that's a lot of words for it to search. Uh, the advanced search strategies give you a little more control over how you approach it. I will say it's pretty common that you need to take a couple of different approaches to find what you're looking for. And again, I'm just going to sound like I'm advertising for that other session. She went through a lot of those more detailed search tips and ideas. Um, I would encourage you to take different approaches. And yes, Jennifer, you're, you're absolutely right. It's much easier than scanning through microfiche, um, where you have to really read all the words. This, this does narrow the searches considerably. 
Shifting gears, I want to show you the last piece, uh, the second piece that's not searched by that homepage bar. And both of these, Chronicling America and the World Digital Library, which I'm going to show you next, um, are partnership collections. So they're part of us, but not part of us, if that makes sense. And I think that's why so far they're not incorporated yet into that search box. How many of you have seen the World Digital Library? Is this at all familiar? No. No. Looks like a lot of no's. OK. <clears throat> I, I, I hope some of you get as excited about this as I do. The World Digital Library is a partnership under the auspices of UNESCO, um, led by the Library of Congress, with international institutions. And the goal of the World Digital Library is to try to make available world treasures. Um, and each of these items is selected for its value to um, the, the country that is presenting it. And each of these items comes with considerable context. Um, sounds like most of you are pretty familiar with the Library of Congress. And so you know, sometimes you get a lot of information about an item, and sometimes you get very little information about an item. The World Digital Library is different. The World Digital Library comes with considerable information. This is what that page looks like. You can see there's a whole long paragraph of commentary. I'm sure you can't read it on your screen, but you can see the bulk of it um, and the depths of it. I'm going to hit some highlights of the WDL. I'm going to invite you to explore on your own. Again, all of these pages are, most of these pages are hyperlinked as well, and that'll be true in the recording. Um, if you look near the top of the page, you'll see the pink box. And that pink box says, listen to this page. All of these pages have audio casts attached to them, which I think are a fantastic support for students who may struggle um, decoding the written word. They can, they can take in the content, but they might struggle decoding the text. And there's more. These pages can also be translated into all of the languages of the UN plus Portuguese. Portuguese because Brazil was an early strong partner in this. So the objects themselves, of course, don't get translated, but the context around them does. And so now here's the page in Arabic. And you'll notice at the upper left that same audio cast um, button that was on the page to the right with a, with a pink box around it is there. So there's audio support in seven languages so um, I know several of you said you were librarians. You might share these with your world language teachers. If you're a classroom teacher, you might talk to your world language teacher about ways to um, get some cross-curricular work going on to study the object as a, a historical object, as a cultural artifact in some classes, and to study the language um, in the world language classes. That wraps up the highlights of what I want to show you. If you're interested in learning more about the WDL, I will point out that we had last year a whole session on that presented by the folks who work for the World Digital Library. And I can't do justice to the Zoom capability through a series of screenshots, which is what I'm able to do here. But I would encourage you, go in, play around, explore. There are many, many ways to access that information, more than I took the time to show you. Because honestly, I'm not sure that there's anything less interesting than watching somebody click through um, a screen. So I've really tried to streamline this for you. But I want to leave you with this. I'm back to the library's home page. And the pink box is at the top. I hope you can read that it's around a, a button that says, Ask a Librarian. The Library of Congress has many, many librarians. And many of those librarians are available to help you. So please use this service. 
Clicking on that, and it's at the top of most pages of the Library of Congress, will bring you to this page. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to see that you see value in it, um, Susan and Bonnie, talking about the value of this to, to your language learner students. Um, Jennifer asks the excellent question of, um, is there a guided tour of the library? The library has vast public museum space, and um, there are docent-led tours several times a day. If you're bringing a group, there is a link from the library's homepage um, about visiting. Here, up here at the top, you can you can see that it says, put the green arrow in the right place. There's a link that to visit. And so if you're bringing a group, I forget the, the number, maybe it's either 10 or 20. If you're bringing a large-ish group, I would advise you to contact them in advance and arrange a tour. Thanks, Annie. But absolutely, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous, wonderful space. And I would encourage you to visit. Jennifer, as an individual, you can come join a public tour. Um, you can come wander around. It's, it's an amazing museum space that doesn't get as much foot tra traffic as some of the other beautiful museums in Washington, DC. Um, I just want to point out, uh, before I forget, um, that I was on Ask a Librarian. And I want you to know that you can see the scope of, of the experts available at the library to help you find what you're looking for. Um, I direct your attention to the pink bar at the bottom of the page that's around resources for teachers. That comes into to the office where Ann and I and Kathy work. Um, it's staffed by our amazing colleague, Dana Bell, who um, knows more about the library than anybody I know and likes to, likes to teach about it. So um, if you have a question, use this service. Don't worry too much about directing it to exactly the right place. Make your best guess. And the librarians who field these questions know each other and will forward them. So if, if you send it to Dana and she knows that somebody in another part of the library is better qualified to answer it, she'll forward it on. And that's true for the rest of them.